What is luxury? Is it the experience of sitting in a plush leather seat? Is it being able to afford something exclusive that others cannot? Or is it the joy of experiencing a well-made product that has been built using the very best materials and artisan production techniques? This is not just a luxury car. This is the Mercedes-Benz EQE 500 4Matic. Let's see what it thinks luxury is. Say The last time we were in a Mercedes-Benz, Kate, we were in the EQS, and that was a car that felt very much designed for a passenger rather than a driver. This car is the complete opposite. Yeah, yeah, this car really does feel like a vehicle that you want to drive. And drive quickly. That's pretty brisk for what this car offers. 300 kilowatts, 402 horses, pretty quick. It really shifts when it needs to, but unlike a lot of cars, it doesn't squeal the tires needlessly when you want to go faster. No, it definitely has sufficient traction control to keep that power going to the wheels and then to the road, not just spitting gravel and lots of anger. Yeah, while you can be going very quickly in a very short amount of time, above legal limits, the big bugbear that I have for this is that the braking doesn't match the acceleration. Yeah, I mean, let, let me be clear. This car does stop. I have done several test emergency stops, you know, 60 to zero, straight line, stops, keeps its wheels pointing where it should, brings the car very nicely to a halt. But, one, it has that Mercedes thing where it waves the brake pedal around, so you don't actually know where it's gonna be when you try and put your foot there, which I find pretty obnoxious. And two, there's no feel at all, and sometimes you press it and not much seems to happen, and then sometimes you press it and you're kind of not thrown forwards, but you definitely get a hell of a lot more braking than you're expecting. You know, the braking experience, I got the brakes hot so that they were smelling, and even then I still felt that the car wasn't giving me all of the braking performance that I wanted it to give. I think it would be safe enough to stop in an emergency. It might be the tires on this. This has got the AMG package, the AMG line package. It actually caused us some confusion when we got behind the wheel because we were like, hey, this is not an AMG. Why does it have AMG mats and AMG badged wheels? And it's no, it's the AMG line package, which is what? eight nine hundred bucks on top of the 80 plus thousand that this car is this car as we are driving it right now is basically a hundred thousand dollars give or take on the freeway this is a very comfortable car to sit in it's reasonably quiet it's not the most quiet mercedes-benz i've ever been in that surprised me 
Yeah, it's, it is quiet. It is definitely one of the quieter cars I've been in recently, but yeah, it doesn't have that near silence luxury that you can encounter in certain vehicles. I think one of the car's best features is its four-wheel steering. We just came out of there and it really tucks in nicely. On twisty roads, this car is sublime. And you and I were chatting earlier and I think you'd said you feel like the four-wheel steering on this is better than the four-wheel steering that we experienced on the EQS. I'm curious as to why you think that is. I'm not exactly sure. I think maybe they've refined it a little bit. It certainly feels just a hair better. It feels like I have more control and it feels like I'm getting a little more sensation through the steering. It may just be me. I think I like this car more and so maybe I'm giving it more of a break. But I definitely do enjoy the four-wheel steering in this car in a way that I didn't with the EQS. I think this car encourages you to push it a little further. I think part of that is down to the fact that this is a slightly shorter car than the EQS. And I think it's a, a lot lighter as well. I haven't looked at the figures, but it certainly feels like it rides a lot better. I know you took it over Rocky Mountain Pass earlier today. What was that like? That was a revolting amount of fun. Uh, apart from, for those who don't know, there is one short section where the road surface has basically disintegrated and it's been like that for a while. I went over that and um, things got a little squirrely. But apart from that, it was impeccable. It handled itself really well. It handled the weight of the vehicle really well, which is hard with a 90 kilowatt hour pack on board. It, it, it certainly encouraged me to drive with more vigor and nearer to the limit than perhaps I would normally have done. Well, I guess as we're changing around, it's a good chance for us to talk about the design of this. It's quite aerodynamic. Yeah, very sleek. I like this little, I don't even want to call it a spoiler. It's, it's a spoiler. It's, it's a hint of spoiler. It's a hint of spoiler. Let's talk about the frunk. You, you mean that I'm not allowed in there? Yeah, just like the, the S class, the EQS, you cannot gain access to the frunk. That is verboten. Mm. If you are feeling particularly uh, naughty, you can gain access to it. I know other channels have done it, but there's no space for anything. It's just power electronics and, and everything else. The packaging of this car is a bit of a disappointment, but that said, it feels like this rides lower than other luxury electric sedans of a similar size and price. So, and you don't feel like your feet are up in your nose. There's more cabin space, the, which is a good thing. Let's talk about this. Look at this. This is one of my favorite features of this car. This trunk is completely soft close and it's got like a weighted system. If you look in there, there's like a pulley chain weight system to make sure that it's as soft close as possible. Yes. You can lock everything from inside as you normally would. There is a pass through, but something I want to point out here is that there's a plastic trim piece in the far end of the boot that just doesn't feel very Mercedes. It, it doesn't. It feels like that kind of plastic that's just going to get scratched and end up with little score marks in if you throw your suitcases in when you're going away for the weekend. That lip is also going to cause some issues because it means that you're not going to be able to use the full length of this. Hopefully your average weekend suitcase would be able to go over that, but maybe not. There's not a lot of space under here either. You get a lovely Mercedes-Benz badged bag with some of your emergency equipment in. Your towing eye is nicely available. You've also got a can of tire sealant. Like most EVs on the market, yeah. there are no spares. No spare wheel here. But you do get a, a Mercedes-Benz branded tire inflator and sealant and I would love to know if you use somebody else's tire sealant whether that voids your warranty or not. 
You also have a couple of buttons up here that allow you to flip down the rear seats, but if you use just one of them, what happens? Well, so we initially thought that it was going to get stuck because that's what it appeared to be. But Michael figured out that if you press that button and it flips the seat forward, it can flip the seat forward with such ferocity that the inertia seat belts in the rear, which by the way, in this car are kind of that red accent color yes. because it's AMG line, the seat belts grab it thinking that you're in a car crash. Which is unfortunate. But it does mean that you press these buttons and then you then have to go inside the car and actually finish putting the seats down, which makes this a, a bit pointless. Maybe that's something that Mercedes-Benz can fix in the future. Do I get to drive now? All right. Good. I've got to say, this, this four-wheel steer is just the best. It's remarkable how much smaller the car feels in the way the dynamics of it work. Like, I need to get into this space, I need to get round this vehicle, I need to get into this parking lot. All of that works so much better. Let's talk about this real quick, the traffic light view. Yeah, that's a really nice little feature. The change to have that front camera when you're stopped and you're at a traffic light, you can see it more clearly sometimes and you can see it through this windshield. The dashboard on this is really nicely set up. It's very clear. It's got a weird dashboard mode that I do not like. Uh, can I share it with you? Is this the sport mode? Yeah, look. With the G-force sensor in it. It's the sport mode with the G-force sensor. It looks like you're playing a, a game of intergalactic, I don't know what this is. Yeah. And yeah. look. <laughs> it, 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 is, it is completely ridiculous in the way that a lot of these, I think there's this kind of this notion that they, they need to do something that feels techy and futuristic and so they do these things and you look at it and go I'm not quite sure what that's for but it's sort of amusing but I have to say the one thing that was that this is one of my minor bugbears if I put the steering wheel where I need it or, or at least where I'm comfortable then it blocks about a third of the screen yeah. which is really unhelpful and it manages to actually block the section of the speedometer that I'm most likely to use right. in pretty much every mode of display that it has and the little digital strip of speedometer at the top. So I just don't really know how fast I'm going, but that's fine. So this car does not have level three autonomy like the EQS. It doesn't have that, that pilot assist functionality, but it does have lane keep assist. It does have centering control and you can, as long as you keep your hands on the wheel, it, it's got effectively the same functionality that you would find in autopilot yeah and it does automatic lane changes for you you put the indicator on on the freeway and it'll take you into the next lane if it's safe which is very nice it does work very well you commented you didn't like the touch buttons on the steering wheel no no i find capacitive sensing on steering wheels incredibly aggravating and it's one of the least favorite things about this vehicle that i have it I would brush against them when I was driving, particularly if I'm driving and I'm fairly relaxed and I tend to have my hands around that spoke, probably because I used to drive a Morris Minor a lot and I rest my hands on the spoke. It uh, then goes chirrup every so often or I change some random setting and I'm confused as to why. The other thing that I want to just throw a bone to here are the paddles. So we've got minus and plus. If you press it, you get strong recuperation. If you press it again, you get uh, what it calls intelligent recuperation, which neither you nor I have been able to figure out. No, I worked it out this morning. I worked it out and I remembered from the EQS, the intelligent recuperation, it looks at what the traffic is doing around you and adjusts your recuperation so it tries to stop you before you hit the car in front. So it, it puts the brakes on harder if there's a vehicle in front. Which is all very well, except that when I'm driving in town, I want strong recuperation pretty much all the time because there are many junctions, there are roundabouts, there are traffic lights, and it doesn't do anything for those. The strong recuperation setting is effectively a one pedal drive setting, which is quite nice. But like you say, it does sort of get in the way a little bit. 
And I would note that when you're coming into you know, busy traffic, it's all too easy to hit the minus button and for it to go into intelligent recuperation. And at that point, the car starts coasting and that can be very, very disconcerting. Yeah, I would like... I would like the intelligent recuperation to work in a way that it, it can see the road around you. It has a camera, so it could identify the urban environment around you. And then in the, I think it could make a, a better guess. I think intelligent is an overstatement. It's more of traffic aware recuperation. You know, I think I would quite like to have a, a coffee. Okay. Let's go get a coffee and... I know that we're running a bit low on windshield washer fluid as well. So maybe we can get some windshield washer as well. Yeah, I'll see if there's somewhere around here that does something suitable. That's supposed to be a concierge service. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll press the Mercedes button. I don't know if it's a Mercedes official one, but here at Transport Evolved, it's definitely a feature. Okay. So I ensured you had a lovely beverage. Yes. Yes. And you've had a little bit of a snack. And uh, the concierge service there is excellent. I, I congratulate you. It really you. is. <laughs> I know we, we joked a little bit about that, but it, it does feel... I mean, that is the, definitely the Mercedes-Benz vibe, isn't it? The You don't work on the car, someone works on the car for you. How can I help? Well, I mean, you could listen and tell me why you just interrupted. Okay. I'm sorry, but I can't help you with that right now. That shows very well how the technology aspect of this car compares to some of the other higher-end vehicles that we've driven. <laughs> and you know, I have to hand it, I think Tesla's voice interaction system on the Model 3, Model Y, the S and the X, far better than any other luxury electric vehicles assistant that we've tried. Today. I think that speaks to their origin as a tech company. Whereas this, this speaks to Mercedes origin as a luxury car maker. And it feels very much more like a Mercedes than the EQS that we drove, which honestly felt like a Maybach. Yeah, yeah. I think the cream interior, your puffy white pillow behind your head, that whole deal, it really didn't do it for me. This feels it's not understated. It can't be. It has the Mercedes says trans pride. <laughs> little does. light bar. It is brilliant. Thank you, Mercedes, for supporting trans rights. I, good on you. Good. Yeah. Um, it has, you know, the blingy chrome and the piano black, which I absolutely loathe. But it also has this very nice wood effect, or wood, I suspect, dash. And it just, it feels more like a traditional Mercedes in its interior. The glove box is not necessarily easy to get to, but it does have a small glove box there. That it is, it's, it's fairly deep. You can store the tome that comes with the car. But of course, like the EQS, the owner's manual is here if you want it. And the experience of, of looking up information on this is very nice. You do have a browser that you can use when you're in park. So like a lot of other electric automakers, Mercedes is really leaning into the services provided to the customer while they're parked up. I really wish that an automaker didn't do that and was like, hey, you should get out of the car and stretch your legs and go do something else for a bit. Well, the irony is that certainly back when we started driving electric vehicles, you did spend quite a lot of time charging. But, you know, this vehicle, it doesn't have incredibly quick, rapid charging. It's about half an hour, 10 to 80%. But you don't spend that long in the vehicle. Like, I plug in, I'll usually wander into a grocery store or a cafe, get a drink. Maybe if, uh, if I'm driving the Nero, I'll usually drink the drink and then get back in the car and head on my way. I don't generally sit in the car and go, well, I've got 26 minutes left. Let's talk about charging for a second, because one thing I think that Mercedes-Benz is really good at doing is handling the expectations of the owner. Right now, we have 43% state of charge. According to the car, that is 123 miles of range. And it tells us right now the maximum DC 
charging that we will get if we plug the car in right now is 142 kilowatts. Yes. And I think it's really good to give that kind of information. One of the things that we're really lacking and that we're seeing with people just sitting at a charger because they got free charging or because they haven't had that information available to them in a way that they've really understood or care about is that that top 10, 20% is going to be much slower than anything else. So giving you an idea of this is the maximum I'm going to get, whatever kind of charger I plug into, that's a really useful and important point. And it's something that Tesla's done really well in the past, right. and it's good to see other automakers doing that. Right. So if this was lower, if we had a lower state of charge, the DC maximum would be closer to this car's theoretical maximum, which I believe is either 170 or 180 kilowatts. I've seen both figures quoted. But the other day when I was driving it and it had gotten an 80% state of charge, this number, this DC maximum said, you, you're only gonna charge at 100 kilowatts. Also, we've got the eco charging button, right? So it changes the maximum charge rate to protect the battery. And you can also have this uh, pre-conditioning that you can do to precondition the battery to get it up to a sensible temperature so that when you want to charge, you have access there to that. Slow charging, 10 kilowatts in North America. I believe it's 11 kilowatts in Europe because they have a three phase system. Yeah, which is a little disappointing for Europe. You'd expect rather more, but 10 kilowatts is adequate. I mean, 22 kilowatts would be preferred. It definitely would, particularly at this price point, you'd really expect to see that, but I have a few more niggles that we haven't touched on. The first one is the camera for re reversing. This car has very good cameras, all round camera monitoring system. And when you go into reverse, the reverse image automatically pops up, but the perspective on it is so terrible that it appears that you're not going to fit into any space. Yeah, it has, I think, an ultra wide angle lens on it, which makes it very difficult to judge your distance to anything and really I was entirely reliant on those lines that it draws on there, that's, that's what I have to make match. And I can't, I can't use the rest of my sense of where the car is or size of vehicle, which is, it's a weird problem. And I wonder if that's something you'll get used to driving it, but I certainly haven't got used to it in the time that we've had it. The only other thing I would say about the interior, which is, you know, we're down to the really tiny niggles, is that it has wireless charging and it has wireless CarPlay and Android it Auto does. that both work very well. But I can't use the wireless charging because my phone will not fit in the slot. And it's quite wide, but it's not very deep. So my phone sits at a strange angle. I will comment here that I quite like the fact that the, the, the charging dock for the phone is way up front there. And it means that if you've got cups in here, you can't easily access your phone, which I think is actually good. It prevents driver distraction. I think it would be good if my phone fit. That, that is a fair point. So you were talking about the charging, mm -hmm. which is very good. The other thing we should talk about is the range. Right, because <laughs> we're filming this in the second week of August, and there's been a news story in the papers a lot in the last couple of weeks about how Tesla overestimates its real world range in the EPA test. And there's a whole load of caveats that go with that. Uh, yes, automakers submit their own EPA ranges to the EPA. The EPA then verifies those or can choose to verify those. Um, but it means that automakers can either exaggerate the EPA range or they can underestimate the EPA range. Tesla has chosen to be very optimistic in its submissions to the EPA and Mercedes-Benz has been very pessimistic in its EPA estimates. How many miles and kilometers does this car supposedly get? Roughly 260 EPA miles and that's about 420-ish kilometers. But the real world range that we've seen is in excess of 320, 340. You said you saw 360? Yeah, one which point, is, which is wildly, I think that was wildly optimistic, but probably because I'd been pootling around town. It's over 500. It's um, over 520-ish, 515 kilometers that we've seen. And 
You know, from a from a driver perspective, that is great because it means that the car is very realistic about what it can actually achieve. I would much rather the car underestimated its capabilities and then surprised you than overestimated its capabilities and then left you stranded. Of course, Tesla drivers don't have to worry about it because Tesla has the route planning baked into the car. And when Tesla says, this is the route, it has given you all the places that you can stop at on the way. It literally goes, this is the way you go. Um, it, it's not a Mandalorian. No. However, Mercedes-Benz has a good route planning software in it. It's not as, not as comprehensive as Tesla's. It's going to be interesting to see when Nax comes along. Mercedes-Benz is going to, to start using Nax, as far as I understand it. And I think that's going to change things quite significantly. We've driven it. That is definitely true. We have. And you know what? I like this more than the EQS. I said to you earlier, just after I got here, that I like this far more than I expected to. And I like it more than the EQS, but I actually quite like it. I like the driving experience. I like the four wheel steering. I think it's something that we'd have to get used to in order to maximize it properly. But I do not like the sticker price. No, well, I mean, the sticker price is more than half the price that we paid for our house. Yeah. And, you know, this is 85,000 out of the factory, but this has got like another $10,000 worth of options added to it. And there was a time when you bought a Mercedes Benz because you wanted that car to live for a long time. Maybe you'd keep it for 10, 15 years and then someone else would buy it and keep it on the road. I regularly see 1980s, 1970s Mercedes on the road. Yeah. With still really good interior with engines that are still operating and their owners really love them. Especially here in the Pacific Northwest, there's a lot of biodiesel powered Mercedes Benzes on the road. I don't think that this car is going to be on the road in, what, 40 years time? I mean, I don't know, but I do know that some of the things are not going to be working because it is very unlikely that the connected surfaces are going to still be available for you in 40 years time. And a lot of this car relies on connected technology. I think that's true of every EV. So let's be clear, we're not kind of dismissing Mercedes-Benz just for this. No. But when you have a car that pokes that $100,000 price tag, I would want to either have a car that offers more functionality than this does. The interior is not particularly big. The luggage space is pretty poor for this size of EV. The Tesla Model 3 wipes this to the side of the road and carries on going when it comes to luggage capabilities. I don't think I could with good conscience tell anybody to buy this because of that sticker price. If it was 40 grand cheaper, it probably wouldn't be a Mercedes Benz. It wouldn't be a Mercedes But if it was like a $60,000 car instead of a $100,000 car, I could argue more effectively that this would be a good car. You imagine this was a Genesis with a $65,000 price tag, I would be all over it. Well, put this up against the Lexus that we recently drove at that kind of price point. Yeah, this wipes it. <laughs> this wipes the floor with it. But yes, I get your point that, you know, when you near $100,000, you want something that gives you something that nothing else can. It gives you that exclusivity. And this, this is an exclusive ride. It's mm -hmm. going to be an exclusive ride by the virtue of its price. But I don't think it's exclusive in any other way. It doesn't give you something that... Some extra utility. This feels like it's AMG money. But it's not AMG performance, even though it's the AMG line package. I love the way this car drives. I enjoy driving it. It is quiet, it is comfortable. This is gonna be a great executive transfer service vehicle. This is going to be a great fleet vehicle for high-end hotels, 
high-end businesses who want to show their clients some extra love when they're in town from, you know, cross country. I don't feel many people are going to buy this as their own car, though. No, and that probably belies the problem with the long lifespan issue, because without them selling a tonne, it's going to be much harder to keep it on the road for 30, 40 years. And unlike something like, I don't know, the, the Nissan Leaf or the Chevrolet Bolt EV, which already have a huge number of people behind the scenes working to keep these cars on the road, I don't think there's going to be that enthusiast group keeping these on the road like there was the 70s and 80s Benzes with the diesel engines that are still running today with fossil fuel alternatives like uh, bioethanol or, or, or vegetable oil. Yeah. And I think that is the problem with this. It's a car that in 10 years time is going to feel very old and very outdated. It's not going to have the support. It's not like a Tesla where you have so many of them built that even if Tesla does not want you to keep that car on the road and running, there's enough spare ones that you can cobble together a part or two. And I can't help but wonder what the future of this car is when you consider that Mercedes-Benz doesn't want to work on the B-Class ED anymore. That the Smart for Two ED, which obviously was a Mercedes product at the time, is no longer really supported by the automaker, by Smart Car or by Mercedes-Benz. And that's partly because of the whose responsibility is it to keep it on the road because it's a Tesla drivetrain in both vehicles, or one of them at least. I don't know if Mercedes are going to stand by this. I think that's something that only time will tell. There you have it, our take on the Mercedes-Benz EQE 500-4-matic AMG line. Let us know in the comments below if you think we are correct on our assumptions about this, if we are correct in thinking that this is pretty much an executive transfer service, but also a car for someone who is a middle manager who wants to have a high-end vehicle that maybe isn't a Tesla. Anyway, you can reach out to us using the comment section. You can reach out to us on Mastodon. If you are a Patreon supporter, you can reach out to us in the comments section there. You can also leave a comment on Peertube. And the cool thing about the Fediverse, which we are proudly part of, is that you can use your Mastodon account to leave a comment, I believe, on Peertube. It's all interconnected, it's very smart. Anyway, you'll find links below for all of those, as well as if you want to support us, there are links to our Patreon account. You can also take out a YouTube channel membership. You can send us Kofi, you can send us Bitcoin, or you can buy some cool swag from our swag store. Now with fully charged live USA in San Diego, postponed until next year. You won't be able to come and buy any swag from us in person, so go visit the swag store and buy some stuff there. And scrolling by on our right is our amazing list of charged up supporters. Apologies, I'm going to be reading the list of our fabulous V to G supporters off my phone because it is quite sunny and I can't see the teleprompter. So those lovely V2G Patreon supporters are Alan Tupper, Andrew Martin, Bennett Elder, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C, Hay Esker, John Trammell, Kyle Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter Dillinger, Raging Fellows, Sean Tucker, Stefan Fremgen, Stephen Williams, Tesla in the Gong, Paul Bricknell, Tony Moss, Kyle Hodgson, Chris Center, Denny Hyde, Lance Schaal, Linda Irish, Mike Weeder, and Paul Nelson. And finally, big thanks to our off-grid supporters, Paul Conway, Kevin Burrowbridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Burness, Robert Flannery, Aaron Han, Ellery Hensley, Rory Litwin, JP Fagerback, Dave Kitchen, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris and Michael Johnson, CPU Freak 101, Eric Knack, Joe Bresney, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Nigel S, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and there's someone here I can't see, the sun's just on it. I think you mean and Ian, who... <laughs> rejoined because there was a, an issue with Patreon. By the way, we, we don't have any connection with Patreon processing and there's been a, an issue with all of the credit card payments and some of you have had to unsubscribe and then resubscribe and Ian just did that literally this morning, the day we're filming this. So thank you, Ian. 
That's maybe why I couldn't see it. That may be, maybe why you couldn't see it. As usual, we publish videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday here on the main channel, which you can now watch on both YouTube and also on PeerTube. And on a Sunday, you can find us over on Transport Evolve Take Two on YouTube and on PeerTube, where you can see me or Kate talking about our garden and our chickens and also cogitating on something that has been niggling us for a while or a question that we want your input on because we are all part of the big EV family. Whatever you enjoy next, we hope you have a great day. Stay safe, stay kind, be an ally, and until next time, keep, keep evolving. evolving.